All right, we're on, sir. Is it cougar or mountain lion? Yeah. Um, it is, right? I think there might be different things. I don't think so. <laughs> I think they're definitely different things. You yeah, think I, think you got, I think you got a cougar, a mountain lion, and uh, yeah, puma. No, listen. The cougar, also commonly known by other names, including catamount. Catamount. I've never heard catamount. That okay. Mountain lion, panther, and puma. So they're all categorized as one thing? They're all the same. It's yeah, a large... but you can't tell me a black panther. By the way, this is the first episode of uh, Two Athletes and a Mic. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, uh, we're, under, we're underway. Podcast episode number one here. Great movie, by the way. Black, black Panther. Panther. Quality movie. Yeah. One, large... One a few awards. I don't know if it was, um, you know, no, it was deserving of that, but it was definitely a quality movie. Did it live up to the hype? Discussion topic. Number one. Well, it lived up to the hype because, again, it's the first african-american superheroes i think that mm-hmm. took a lot of the attention let's be honest here you know great movie but you know it's uh when i compare it to the avengers no was it the first african-american superhero yeah was it really yeah at least at least main like character about training day that's, that... that's not a superhero <laughs> no that's, that's not just a, a, not an origin a, story it's just, just a black <laughs> op <laughs> Who turned out to be a dirtbag? To, to be quite honest, he's the villain of the he's the villain of the story of the movie. Oh, man. So let's give a little break. We'll get back into that. So let's go over who you are and who, and who I. I think it's a quality conversation. Yeah, I think so. so Matt, he's got us in trouble early yeah. on here. He canceled before we get started yeah. here. So we got four years of OHL hockey. Yeah, dude. I think yeah. this is concussions. <laughs> Had a, right? had a few. Yeah, yeah. A few. <laughs> Hence uh, the discussion uh, topics that are going to come up today. <laughs> plenty of yeah, those. Yeah. As your musician as well. I am. So you know, we're two athletes in the mic. We're, we're more than that. We're more than just a couple athletes and coaches, right? Two, yeah. A couple of musicians too. You know, I'm not a musician, so one I'm athlete. So you're a math. No, no I'm an athlete. No fucking chance. No, no, <laughs> no chance. And then your provincial level uh, baseball. I did, yeah. <laughs> I did the. I, I did. did. I did participate. Did do that. Let's see what you got. Two, two sport varsity athlete was it football and wrestling yeah wrestling yeah wrestling there. you're a, little, a wrestler little roman greco little roman greco eh? yeah just a, just a just killing a, machine just a slab of meat give it her u of t it's not that's good it's not bad it's a, just a couple of academics oh too good yeah we're rivals yeah 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 i played hockey there for a little bit very short period of time a cup of coffee yeah it was, yeah that was about it yeah yeah. A couple of scraps, a couple of goals. No scraps. Can't fight. And, you yeah. can't fight. Not in the university. In hockey. Hockey. No, no, it was weird. Which is kind of fucked because they they were, like, aren't they kind of prepping you for like the OHL at that point? Or the no, OHL it was OHL after. Before? It was after the OHL. So I uh, <clears throat> I played my four years in the OHL and I was going to York University at the time. So then I just decided that I was going to uh, try over that. Well, I got asked to, to come out for the hockey team. Made the team, was on the team. Just the big man walking down the hall campus, and yeah, yeah. The kids, was, it, the, my mom, my mother was on. very ill at the time, and so then that that led to me quitting very, okay. very quickly. Uh, and she died, and then uh, Whoa. so <laughs> Whoa, <now. laughs> to throw that. In there. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, adventure and endurance athlete. Sorry to hear that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> he goes yeah. into my goes into my stats again. Jeez. Yeah. Good was, transition. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sweet segue. So anyone died during the endurance race that you ran? No. No? Surprisingly Everyone's not. Good. Healthy? You, you thought that, right? You thought people got really seriously I, I did. I, I Well, I, I would assume just with the taxation on the body that that would happen from time to time. But, you said but I think a lot of people, they're aware of like the, the limitations. Again, they'll, they'll quit, they'll fall out, and they'll maybe have dehydration and shit like that. But the, yep. no one's died yet. Nothing. Not that I know of. Nothing severe. No. Some guy broke some ribs on the last one. He, he fell asleep. I think it was like two o'clock in the morning and he fell asleep running and he fell over the a cliff area which again it sounds real deadly but luckily it wasn't that <laughs> steep he broke his ribs falling asleep while running yeah so is there any part of these athletes yeah. that realize that if you are actively falling asleep during your performance that it might be too long probably you might be working a little too long. Yeah, but you don't you don't see it coming. It's like you eating a pretzel and falling asleep. <laughs> like, if you knew you were gonna fall asleep, you probably wouldn't have put that pretzel in your mouth. <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> Wait, but you this chose. Is a true story. You, yeah. True story. yeah. So you were so eating the, a pretzel and you uh, you already started chewing. I was talking. Well, we were I, we were both coaching together yesterday, and 
uh, didn't you fall asleep at home, you said? I did, yeah, oh, but okay. it was, I'd been up for a, a long time. And, uh, I was watching Parks and Rec. Quality show. Quality show. Yeah, Chris Pratt. And I didn't know I did this, but yeah, apparently I fell asleep while chewing. And you chew. <laughs> I woke up to my wife just staring at me on the other couch, and she was looking at me like there was something seriously wrong with me. And, uh, <laughs> I was like, what? She's like, go to bed. You just fell asleep while you were eating. And so that was uh, that's a, a good, revelation. That's a good, revelation. That's a good cue. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. So tell us about... Uh, Tell me about the uh, the endurance races. What, yeah, what have you done? They're fun. So I did the, the Moab 240 last year. Didn't complete it. You know, so what is the Moab 240? So it's for those for those people who, for those don't, who don't know. know. For those yes. who don't know, what's the Moab? So 240? it's one of uh, the longest ultra marathons in North America. Uh -huh. So it's a multi day stage race. Uh -huh. So it's 240 miles, and you're running, hiking, walking the entire thing. Ideally, you can there's sleep stations. You can sleep at certain stations. Um, I think 75 miles in in every 15 miles are are sleep stations. But, you know, and it's, it's fully aid stations and everything like that. So you get the food and you get all that stuff taken care of. And you still got to bring your shit when you're going. So it might be, you know, five to six hours in between aid stations. So you got to have the right fuel in and stuff like that. But that's a multi-day stage race. So you got to. So 240 finish. miles. Ahead. Sorry, how long do you have to complete this? This was, a, I had 112 hours to complete it. So I had four and a half days. I didn't. I, I, days. I had a partial tear about 40 miles in. I thought it was a cramp. Um. You know, fought through it for 40 miles. Tear and, uh, what? The calf. The calf. Oh, the calf. Yeah. So, so you failed. Failed. You failed. Failed. Definitely failed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> big, big old. Big, fail. big old. Big old fail. Big old YouTube, fail. YouTube stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, so we did some other ultras. Canadian Death Race last year. Did that one. Which you, you know, completed. I completed with an hour and a half to spare. It was a 24 hour cut. See, that, that was, a, that's impressive. The Canadian Death Race yeah. that is 125 kilometers. Yes. Kilometers, yes. right? Not miles. Okay. Because we're in Canada. Yeah. We use sensible measurement systems. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so 125 kilometers. Which is a beast. It was a fucking lot of elevation. So it's a fairly high altitude, though, correct? Yeah. I didn't feel it that much. A lot of people were saying like the altitude's in it because it was in um, Grand Prairie, Alberta. Yeah. But it didn't feel like, I don't know, maybe my condition was on point, I guess. I don't know. But uh, more the blizzard, yeah, it's the interesting. I, got a hold of me. I haven't done a ton of altitude training, but uh, I did train for a little while, um, a period, just a short period of time in Colorado Springs, Colorado, yeah. which is fairly high altitude. Um, and, you know, the level of, of oxygen is significantly less than it is, you know, where we are almost at sea level in Ontario. And uh, I, I did not notice much of a difference. And I thought I would. Didn't you, so you, was, didn't you hike, though, at, the, at one point? That yeah. was, yeah. You're all fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> that was I, that may have. So you didn't, been, you didn't uh, feel it most of the time, but then you hit one spot that, that hit you. Yeah, this is when I was younger, but we, oh, were, okay. we were smoking pot on the way down, and then after Colorado. Yeah, legalized. And then we, this was there's a place called Pikes Peak, which is uh, I don't know, it, it's either the highest or the second highest. Or, I don't know. It's, it's very high. It's very, very <laughs> it's high. high. It's, 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 it's it might be high. But it, it was. Uh, you going downhill? It's huh? definitely. It's one of the highest points, I believe, in the American Rockies. Yeah. But it was. It was crazy because we were there in. Uh, I believe it was July, and it was. Uh, what it was exceptionally warm. It was summer weather. Uh, at, you know, in Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. and then by the time you get to the top of Pikes Peak, which is just uh, you know one of the most treacherous drives you could possible yeah, imagine that as well. uh it there's that there's it's snow there's snow at the top which is so you got summer in the bottom top you got snow it's basically it's winter at the top yeah and uh so then we got down halfway and they had this checkpoint about halfway down where they test your brakes on your car because you're riding them essentially the whole way down and they uh and there are signs that, that tell you exactly how you're supposed to drive down the mountain mm -hmm. which we apparently were not uh, obeying uh and we just got to this checkpoint and i i was driving and i slammed on the brakes and the car wasn't stopping. And so we just kept on going and going and going. And then finally I pulled the e-brake to stop the car. And uh just so then, composed, eh? Yeah, just yeah. <laughs> just like a, it was it was yeah. You're freaking out. It I I it, it happened quick, you know, yeah. like I just realized that I was kind of careening towards this little like gift shop thing. I was either <laughs> pull the e-brake. Mom and pop or, say, hey, or, yeah, slow down. Pull the e-brake or uh end up next to the novelty uh, license plates and uh, luckily stopped in time. And then the the guy, the 
I don't know, park ranger or something, had a uniform on and uh, came over and tested our brakes and said, you got to wait for three hours. So we had nothing to do. <clears throat> and we were young and four Perfect. guys, four guys in the car and one of the guys in a bag of Colorado weed. And so uh, we, we got high and then went for a hike. And uh, I was not a real, like at the time, I wasn't a big pot smoker. That I, th I think the, but anyway, long story short, we went, we ended up doing this. It, it turned into this kind of like mock parkour course where we were just kind of jumping off things and running. And we had this destination. We, we bet, I bet one of my friends that, you know, who could race to this, this destination the quickest. Then we got there and I, I couldn't breathe. It, it, it was like five minutes before I got my breath back. And, uh, and that was the only time that I've ever experienced any type of, uh, and it's like, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it just, where you realize that it does, that it absolutely can affect you. Now, down in Colorado Springs itself, we're doing a lot of Olympic lifting. It was, uh, Were you doing it for a training camp? No, I was down there for a coaching course. Coaching course? Yeah, yeah. I was getting a, it's a certification called the USAW, which is a United States weightlifting certification. And, uh, there's a few levels. It was either the club coach, I suppose, or the women's coach or something. What do you, yeah. What's that? What do you call well, them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Put, put those two, yeah, two right. together. Yeah, put them right. together. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Create one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, it was, it was, it was I, run, I, run, I run the studio now. Yeah, yeah, naturally. <laughs> the, uh, so Canadian death race, 100 back to that. Yeah. 125 kilometers. Uh, and you had, what was it, 24 hours? 24 hours, yeah. So, it'd be, you know, for anybody listening, contemplate. Like what is what is that what what pace do you have to maintain that what is it do you do you know how many minutes per kilometer over the course of twenty four hours do, is this do math right there I think it's eleven if I'm doing the is math it? correctly in my head so we're doing one hundred and twenty five k one twenty five divided by twenty four we're doing five point two k per hour five point two no but it would be eleven minutes per kilometer oh, okay yeah something like that there yeah. you go. Yeah, so you get when you're when you're yeah, because if it's five point two k an hour, right? So that you times yeah, yeah, you divide that, that by the yeah. sixty. Yeah. That'd be roughly one. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, you just you try to run the, the flat, the elevation. You just try to keep consistent, and the shit comes up where you don't know. It's just that unpredictability of blisters. You have cramps. You have injuries. This is what it is, right? It was super muddy. Yeah. It fucking sucks. I had two poles. Okay. Yeah. We're like ten miles into this thing, and we get to this really muddy train. So I stick one pole in, pull it out, it breaks. And the, when you're going uphill, like you want those poles leverage. Like you want to be able to dig in, especially going downhill too. Yeah. You're breaking the whole time. We're putting so much stress on like your quads. Yeah. And if you're anyone's in like a backward sled. Yeah. It's like that's your quads are firing. So when you're going downhill really steep and fast, your quads are just firing. So you want to have those poles to kind of break you. Of course. So yeah, early on one of them broke. Luckily it was one of those extension ones, so I could kind of have it's a little uneven, but we we're still able to kind of make do. But with the muck, like my shoe came off and my sock got all mucked up and wet. I think I only had two pairs of, uh, of socks for the for the run, so I got super blistered. Because you went, probably went ten hours with like a muddy, wet foot, right? And then you, I was pretty uneducated at the times. So I was putting band aids on it and shit. Yeah, trench foot. Back it was. In the it was war. basically like trench foot. Yeah, trench foot. This is basically like the war. I was in a war. Yeah. A twenty four hour war and. I was putting band-aids on the blisters, which doesn't do anything realistically. All it does is it makes it there's more friction that involved because you put your sock on. Yep. Band-aid comes off, more friction. So my blisters were just on my soles of my feet were mangled and I was hobbling through it, but uh we made it. Accomplished. And it's funny, if you're listening to this and somebody would think, Oh, blisters, you know, a yeah. blister's a blister. It's but a blister. like you know, if you're going 125 kilometers, you started noticing the blisters at what point? How many how many kilometers in? Probably more miles guy, but probably 40 k in. Yeah, so then you're running on you're running on shredded feet yeah. for two thirds of the race. Yeah, probably 20 miles in. Yeah, they see that's it, right? that's brutal. You know, I think that's it. Just keeps getting worse and worse. And you go to aid stations, they try to fix you, but when the damage is done, it's hard to kind of yeah, come back absolutely. from. So, but it's an experience. Yeah. And the crazy part, we love animals. We like talking animals. Obviously, that's how we started this thing. <laughs> uh, but you walk one area, and it literally says you're entering grizzly territory. Yeah. Now, I told you about this story, but I'm going to tell you again, podcast listeners. So I, I'm a big bear guy. I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, we're going to Alberta. I'm going to be out there running through the night with my little headlamp through bear train. But I was like, right, let's, let's, let's just see if there's been any instances on this trail before. Uh -huh. So I think it's like two weeks before I'm about to go. 
I Google a couple things. Like, All right, let's see if there's any bear attacks on the Canadian death race. Family of four. Gun missing. <laughs> <laughs> two days prior to me Googling this, it says two trail runners preparing for the Canadian death race were attacked by two grizzlies. Didn't die, but they kind of got they got knocked over. I think they had a bit of a scuffle. The one lady was hitting the bear with the pole. I think it was just a cub instance. That there uh, was a, a couple of cubs at the moment. Bear kind of got freaked out. Um, luckily, the bears took off and didn't do any real damage. But again, like two weeks later, uh, here I am running in that on that terrain and twenty four hours through the night in yeah. grizzly territory. And it's just crazy when we talk about that because so many people are just willing, like, hey, fuck it, we're just gonna run, assume nothing bad's gonna happen to us. Hopefully. No cubs are there. I guess the amount of people, this is like a thousand people race, right? Yeah. A thousand person race. So well, it is the death race. It is, it is death race. Yeah. yeah. So, so you grizzly bears you, you are kinda, uh, you kinda want a they, couple they deaths go, to they go, <laughs> they go to validate this. Listen, thing. Listen, if nobody dies during the death yeah. race ever, the, yeah, yeah. It takes appropriate. the cachet away from it. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was uh Absolutely. that was kind of the thing I was I was most freaked out about going into it. Because it's, it's probably not gonna happen. But if it does Fuck. And let's be serious. If you if you end up in a tilt with a bear, with a bear especially a grizzly bear, you're not you're not coming no, out on top. No, no. Well, especially my blisters. Unless you're Leo DiCaprio, then you know he got fucked up. Yeah, that video. he did. But he won. Well, I don't think he I won. Don't, the well, bear won. The bear just said, "I'm not going to kill you today." I think if you don't, I'm going to fuck you. Up. You're a winner. Yeah. You don't. If you don't get killed in a grizzly bear fight, you're a winner. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I think that's a good point. Yeah, because you're not gonna you're not gonna beat a grizzly. You're not gonna take a grizzly out. Yeah, chances are. Um, which can lead into our next conversation. Unless you're a gorilla, a silverback well, gorilla. Well, we've been over this plenty of times. But, but, but you and I, debate. we're both on the same page on this one. The grizzly, the grizzly, the grizzly. Take, take out a grizzly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just the, the sheer size of the grizzly. Yeah. Unless you're talking Kodiak. Yeah. Hey, Kodiak brown bear, fucking 1,100 pounds. I'll be honest, when we, when we were looking at those comments, this is a pretty vicious Instagram yeah. debate. Yeah. Uh. I was healthy, thinking healthy debate. healthy debate, yeah. But I was I was genuinely thinking anybody who goes with a gorilla is a <laughs> fucking idiot because yeah. there's there's no <laughs> there's no way there's no yeah. there's no way a gorilla is taken out of grizzly. But then but the stats were showing that why people I think were going towards the gorilla was that the gorilla's pure pound for pound strength and force was much greater than a grizzly. But then the <sighs> debate goes into yeah pound for pound force versus like overall mass and size and strength. Still goes to the grizzly. It's just that force from a gorilla. But again, a gorilla is standing five feet tall. A Kodiak's like double that. eleven. Double that. Yeah. And the weight's eleven hundred pounds to say four hundred, five hundred pounds. Yeah. That's a lot of that's some sheer sheer force and size coming at you. So let me ask. So when you're doing these ultras, right? yeah. Because how many how many ultras have you done? And for those I'm of done. you for those who who don't know what an ultra marathon is, why don't you? Why don't you so it's anything longer than a marathon. A marathon, right? Yeah. So it could be a fifty mile, could be a hundred mile. Could be 50k, could be 200 miles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, what? Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the athletic mindset. Yeah. The focus yes. that goes into that. So, the training for one. I know that you've mentioned to me in the past that you uh, you jumped into one. What was it? Six weeks out. So I did. I had a challenge. Like I did this 365 day challenge. One of my month's challenges was do a marathon and ultra marathon in the same month. Okay. Two, three weeks apart. So I had three weeks to train for the marathon and I had six weeks to train for the 50 mile ultra. For the 50 mile ultra. Yeah. And you completed the 50 mile. Completed the 50 mile, 12 hours. So the training, mm -hmm. what, what, let's talk training because we're both coaches. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk training for a marathon because my, you know, my background is in competitive hockey mm -hmm. and Olympic lifting and very much power endurance focused sports. Um, the duration of work typically when you're training hockey players, when you're training football players, rugby players, which my expertise is in weightlifters. Yeah. Um, it, it is a totally different element from somebody who's training for something like an ultra marathon. Right. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about the training, um, running versus strength development. Was there a healthy combination of well, both? Did that's you focus far more on running? Did you definitely more on run? You have to in that, in that kind of distance. It's just there's yeah. so much repetition and there's just so much involved, so much volume involved. At the same time, I wanted to be a hybrid athlete in terms of, like I wanted to keep my build. Yeah. I wanted to keep my strength up. Like I didn't want to go down to a runner's body. I, like, I wasn't looking to win this thing and be the most efficient runner's body. Right. I was like, let's get down to a level where I can consistently push my body and complete a fifty miler, but still keep 
some strength, so keep my size, keep my build. So I didn't do it intelligently in terms of like, I want to be the best ultra marathon runner. I said, how can I incorporate this hybrid aspect of me being an endurance athlete and me also being a strength endurance athlete? And that's the crossbreed that I'm trying to do now with like the world's strongest triathlon, for example. We're going to be doing a Olympic distance triathlon, but I'm going to put a hundred pound log on my back right? and swim with that and bike with it. That's a balance of strength but with muscular endurance as well. And then you're increasing your VO2 max and you're doing a lot of these different aspects of uh, figuring out. So it's tricky, but for that, for the ultras is a lot of volume, right? So I was in the weight room, I do a couple of strength sessions, but a lot of it was still more high intensity oriented, volume oriented, trying to get muscular endurance. So I do more burnout sets, obviously. I finish off a lot of things that would burn my legs out. Try to get that lactic threshold increase. I want to be able to not hit that lactic build up too fast, right? Because that's when your muscles really can't work too efficiently. Right. So and just a lot of volume and a lot of miles on, on the road. And, um, you know, my knees were hurting and trying to do miles on the bike just to at least get that aerobic capacity kicking. Because in terms of strength development, I mean, the the running for a running race is, you know, it seems pretty self-evident that that, that has got to be the primary focus of your training. Yeah. Right. However, um, the amount of demand on your joints over a period yes. of time like that. And I think that is something, because I, I have trained uh, multiple marathon runners, triathletes over the mm -hmm. years. And one of the things that I've always tried to focus on in their development is the structural support uh, of the joints themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not essentially trying to build tissue the same way you would with you know, maybe a hockey player or a football player. Yeah. But you are trying to structurally strengthen every joint mm -hmm. from the hips down. Exactly. Right. Because I think that's something that a lot of runners, well, it is something that a lot of runners fundamentally lack in their development, mm -hmm. right? They focus so much on running. They don't do enough mobility work, mm -hmm. right? They don't pay any attention whatsoever to their own flexibility or their dynamic ranges of motion. Yeah. And because of that, you see a lot of unnecessary injuries in endurance athletes, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly at the joint levels. And so, because with you, you know, I wasn't in, I never got in, all these things I did. It was never like, uh, for the most part, other than the Moab one, which is again, shit just happens when you're in that kind of heat, yeah. and that kind of distance. But I, it was mostly just like maybe some cramping, just bad fueling, you know, it was just unintelligent fueling. But that's got to be strong. Might the be. fact that you weren't getting injured. Yeah, and exactly. you haven't been injured, you know, in terms of it, you've, in other words, maintained your joint integrity yeah. through all of these dis these incredible distances, mm -hmm. right? It has to be a testament to the fact. And that, I was doing that a very short training notice was, too, right? Right. But right. it has so, to be something that a testament to something that would, you know, the intelligence of your training, right? Exactly. Because it, for you know, for anybody listening, like it, it's your, for example, just take one lift. Like, what's your bench press right now? What's a one RM bench press? So you have a one rep max bench press of 350 yeah. and you're an ultra marathon athlete, right? And I, I don't know if people would appreciate how fucking rare that is, right? Like how many, really, what percent of people do you think that you were running against in the Canadian death race could bench press even 200 pounds for males? Yeah. You're, you're you know, like there cannot be maybe. if that, yeah. yeah. Right. Because it, it is so to have that that range and in, in dynamic, mm -hmm. you know, throughout your training is, is something unique, which is, which is uh, fun to train for. Absolutely. Right. Because it allows you to kind of blur those lines, because sometimes you get caught in that balance of like one well, endurance athlete does this in the gym. Yeah. And they don't and they stay away from strength training. You're like you said, no, like there's a lot. There's, there's a time for strength training. and There's a way to incorporate it how to do that intelligently is kind of that fun balance, right? And when you're an endurance athlete, a lot of it is, it, it's strictly preventative, right? Like when you are, when you are training for performance, any type of elite endurance performance, a lot of the strength training for me with the athletes that I've coached was simply preventative measurements that you are putting in place to avoid any type of injury. Yeah. Because particularly in a runner, uh, injuries can be absolutely devastating to your career as a competitive athlete, right? Like what's the worst injury? I, I've sustained a slew of them, but what's the worst injury that you sustained during a performance, whether it be football, wrestling, anything like that? Uh, I've been pretty lucky to be honest with you. Like the calf tear was my, I made a high ankle sprain. Yeah. It was looking crazy. Never had like dislocations or torn ligaments. Or Which is kind of like fucked that. up that I used to fly around playing football, <clears throat> but no, concussions. See, even at, you know, as a result of my hockey and, you know, weightlifting, uh, 
Like I had, I've had a slew of concussions, but I had 37 breaks. You know, I had awesome. two dislocations and a separation in my shoulders. Uh, multiple MCL tears, meniscus tears, partial ACL tear. Um, you know, you name it. It's uh, it's been it, it's been yeah. And one of the things that I have to focus on every day, and and I, I firmly believe that everybody should regardless of whether you're a competitive athlete or you sit at the desk, you know, selling insurance and drive 45 minutes to and from work every day, yeah. but we don't pay enough attention to our own individual mobility. Right. And it, it it's amazing, not only the performance in the gym and what you will get out of it, but the quality of life that yeah. you get from focusing, just paying some type of attention to your own mobility needs. When you see the guy like you, man, you're a big guy. You can do a lot of athletic stuff, but you're yeah, I mean, so I'm six, mobile two, two, and, and, and flexible, and incredibly and mobile. Right? Yeah, but it was it was almost forced upon me as a result of some of the injuries that I sustained because there were days that I would wake up and I would realize like I am going to be in pain, probably you know in the low back and the knees for people, the rest of my wait life. For that, right? They almost absolutely wait to get rock before they're like ah oh, now I got but now I got to focus on it. But by that point, it takes a lot of work and dedication, or yeah. sometimes it's you know a little bit too late to feel like you were ever a hundred percent healthy again. Yeah. Um, but you know, even after sustaining all of those injuries, today, you know, when I train, I you know, there is nothing that I that I worry about. You know, I'll jump on, jump off just about anything. Like I'll do some crazy shit. Yeah. Um, check and out I your go, Instagram. If you don't yeah, like check, yeah, check out my Instagram. Yeah. Um, but I will do some crazy shit. But I uh, I don't worry at all about the you know injuries or repercussions. You know, the day after, two days after a result from that. But it is it's because I have spent an immense amount of time, you know, rehabbing certain injuries over the years, putting measures in place through my training to prevent any further injury from ever taking. Yeah. and working on my own mobility because typically injuries at the joint level happen you know fundamentally happen when that joint is pushed beyond its capable range of motion yeah right so if you can create a new normal so to speak you know to put it in the most lame Keep talking terms possible. The camera's going yeah so you you put it in the most or, or you you push the limitations of that joint, limitations of that joint in an intelligent way in a controlled environment Right. The, the benefits are, are immense. And I think one one interesting thing that, that people never contemplate, particularly guys, right, is the aesthetic benefit to mobility sure. work. Okay. Right. Like, into that. It, and, and it's it's yeah, an interesting. Minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting discussion topic because guys like guys are the worst. Right. For this, like guys the spend worst. the worst, the always worst, the man. worst at everything. <laughs> But they do. They go in and like how many guys around? It, it's almost laughable. You can walk into any good life, yeah. any LA fitness, anything like that, and you'll just you, you you could find 15 guys at any moment of any day, whether it's fucking five o'clock in the morning, seven p.m. at night. They're standing three feet from a mirror, watching themselves do bicep curls day in, day out. Yeah. Right? Or just spending, you know seven years straight masturbating under a bench press bar and then wondering why they can't hold a bar over their head. Yeah. <laughs> like it's can't lock their elbow, you know? Hey buddy, lock your elbow up. Ah, it is locked up. You literally can't even force the joint through a full range of motion because everything is so tight and restricted because yeah. they've literally worked their biceps seven days a week for five years, you know? And they got grit. I mean, they got symmetrical good biceps. It looks yeah. good, good yeah. biceps. But, <laughs> Ridiculous. But yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Right? Again, it's just the media gratification versus long term fulfillment, right? So that they're going towards like, yeah, I want to get that fucking nice pump on Absolutely. to impress uh <laughs> press the ladies and a couple of guys at the bar and then yeah. uh rather than say, Hey, how do I sustain a more quality of life long term? And guys, when you're doing bicep curls, I know we gotta wrap this up. Yeah. But just we got the producer giving us the old let's go. The old heave ho. Heave ho. Let's it's turned into a gong show. We're just going to be yanked <laughs> off the fucking chair. Uh, please, for the love of God. Yeah, this is a little bro tip. This is a good bro this tip. Is a bro, yeah, okay. This is a bro tip. This is a bro tip. tip to end up? We'll throw one of these in a week. Every, yeah. So, bro tip. Guys, take it from two guys who spent their lifetime training hard in a gym. In gyms. Yeah. Please, for the love of God, stop looking at your biceps when you're training them. Yeah. <laughs> 
They ain't gonna grow faster. They don't. No. 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 Guys just <laughs> staring. Just staring down at their biceps. It's a vein pump. Curl. They want to see that vein just grow. Don't slightly. do it. You look ridiculous. It's not hot. The girl that's on the abduction adduction machine is not the staring at you in the mirror. No, <laughs> you know, they're not pumping her groins, checking you out, right? They think Don't it though. They, they think, think it, it right? They that's the problem. It. That's a big problem. They think it. And if you look like a tree with no roots, if you got tiny little legs, even if you have I'm 20 inch arms, if I see some skinny legs, man, I'm not, you I'm look not ridiculous. Ridiculous. You, really. No, unless you're a fighter, then you know, man, we got some. I think Fighters don't have skinny legs. No, that's what I mean. Usually they're no. pretty. They're, they're they're training those. Yeah. 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 yeah don't be that guy. Yeah. You're you're a victim now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we gotta bounce. We gotta wrap this up. It's been. Hey, phenomenal. cutie. Hi. This is Carson. Hi, hey, Carson. Carson. You gonna say hi? Good talk. It's quality talk. <laughs> episode one. All right. Episode done. one. Done. <laughs>